All right, we're going to kick off our uh, three-week Easter service series. And uh, I want to open with this verse before I tell you the title of it. And it's out of Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. And here's what it says. It says, Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So our Easter series is entitled, The Power of Emptiness. And I tell you, we have a messed up concept <laughs> a, of what emptiness really is. Because ultimately, in the natural, we hate emptiness. I just mentioned I don't like being alone. <laughs> don't like that my bed was empty. I literally woke up at about 2 in the morning, freezing. I'm like, what is going on? I'm like, oh, my wife's gone. <laughs> My little built-in heater's not here, and so I'm like trying to find a blanket and figure out how to stay warm, you know. But really, empty for us, is, it's normally a bad thing. It's like a, a disappointing thing. It's like it's, it's all gone. It's, there, there's nothing left, you know, and we get um, bummed if the fridge is empty. We get bummed if our bank account's empty. You know, we, we, we get bummed if our love tank is empty. You know, the reality is this. We get bummed if our gas tank's empty. <laughs> Especially right now, right? Because <laughs> when our gas tank is empty, that means we've got nothing left. I literally drove around yesterday. I was at the church all day. There's people here working on stuff. And, and I don't know how many trips I made on empty. Just, just hoping, <laughs> just hoping I could keep going, right? And, you know, but that's what we do. We try and see how far we can go with just, you know, a little, a little bit left. It's water, don't worry. <laughs> it's not gas. Come on. Jewel's right there. I'm smarter than that. <laughs> Work with me, people, right? So... For us, emptiness is just such, a, it's such a, a disappointing thing. We think, man, it is going to cost me something now to fill up, right? This is going to be a process. It's, it's going to take time. That's actually why I was driving around on empty so long, is I didn't have the time, right? Well, let me say this. I have a 23-gallon tank, and I put in 22 point something gallons of gas, so I was like, <laughs> I was riding fumes, right? But, that, but that's what so many of us do. We live our lives and we find ourselves empty. And then we don't know what to do. We either can't afford to fill our bank account back up. We can't afford to fill our gas tank up. You know, we can't seem to figure out to fill, you know, how to fill our own emotional love tank. We, we can't figure it out and it's hard. But ultimately, God has a whole different idea and concept when it comes to emptiness. You see, again, we look at it, and we're like, there's, there's nothing left. There's nothing in here. But the way God looks at it is, okay, wait a minute. Now there's an empty vessel that I can fill. That's how God looks at it. Now, ultimately, it says this, 2 Corinthians 12, 10. That's why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness and insults in hardships and persecutions in difficulties. For when I am weak, when I am empty, when my tank is totally gone, when I got nothing left, when I don't have the right attitude, when I don't have enough finances, when I don't have, you know, what the next step is, when I can't figure a situation out, when I'm empty, when I'm weak, that is when God sees an opportunity to pour out his presence, his power, his anointing, and fill us with everything that we need. And it's actually a beautiful thing. But, you know, there's a lot of preachers today who don't preach emptiness. 
Just throwing that out there. You know, now I'm not saying God doesn't want to bless us. He totally wants to bless us, but he blesses us so that we can be a blessing. So the more we have, it's so that the more we can give and the more we can be a conduit for for God and for his kingdom. It, It is a wonderful thing. But again, we have to get past this concept of what emptiness really is. I love Carla's song there, I'm not enough. (laughs) Yeah, I'm not. I'm not. When when it comes to trying to figure out life, when it comes to trying being a good husband or being a good dad or being a good employee or being a good pastor, I mean, I just, I literally sit there and I think, God, I can't do this. It's hard. I I, I got nothing left. Well, I I got a little drop. I, I can get a little smile on my face. I'll be honest, last week when we prayed over 40-some new, new members to the church who had just finished growth track, I went home excited, and I'm like, God, I, what am I supposed to do? What are we supposed to do? How, how, I, I don't have enough, and the answer is, that's perfect. <laughs> that's perfect. That's exactly what he wants. He wants us to empty ourselves of everything we think we are, everything we think we're not, everything we have, and just come before him and say, God, here I am. Because there truly is power in emptiness. But we see it as the ending point, and God sees it as the launching point. So next time your tank's on empty, just think, oh, God's ready to launch me into something just not in your car. (laughs) Throwing that in there. So here's what I want to do real quick. I want want to look at Jesus' life a little bit because I feel like there's so much that we can learn and we can glean that applies to ourselves. And ultimately, the whole Easter story, it's so beautiful because I just read to you that it's about Jesus emptying himself getting rid of his position, getting getting rid of everything that he had and becoming a servant for us, literally laying down his life, giving everything, including his last physical breath, for us. That's the Easter story. It's beautiful. It's powerful. But I want to look at Matthew chapter 26, and we're going to look at verses uh, 36 through 44. I want to read a little bit of it here. But here's what I want you to understand, because... Jesus, in human flesh, on this earth, was actually wrestling with the concept of emptiness. He's human. He's normal. Right? So I want to start reading. Verse 36. It says, Then Jesus went with his disciples. Anybody know how many there were? Very good. Sure there wasn't a baker's dozen? Yeah? All right. He went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He's like, okay, you guys stay here. I'm going to go pray. It says he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. Anybody know who they are? James and John. All right, good job. Just checking. We got some scholars out there. So he he took James James and John along with him. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. So he's carrying this weight about what God is asking him to do. Anybody in here ever carried a weight because of what God's asking you to do? I mean, even just taking the step of salvation carries a little bit of weight because it means a complete change and transformation of who you are in your entire life. It's foreign. It's unknown. You don't know if, if you can be, you know, who you're supposed to be. You don't know if you can change the way you think, the way you talk, the way you treat people. You, you don't know. There's a weight that comes with it. You're so used to the old. And it goes on in verse 38. It says, then he says to him, he says, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. I mean, he is on fumes. He's like the emotional weight of what God's asking him to do. His natural tank is empty. He leaves 10 of them over here. He leaves two of them right here. And he barely makes it a little ways. And he falls on his face to cry out to God. 
It says, going a little further, he falls down with his face to the ground and he prays. He says, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. That, that, that's, that's the humanness of him. What you're asking me to do, God, is so hard. It's so hard. Is there any other way? Is there a button I can push? That's what most of us want. Is there an easy road instead of the hard road? Does it have to be a cross? Like, could I, like there's a lot easier ways to die. Like, I'll, I'll just take a one and done. Can we go that way? You know what I mean? I'm willing to die, but not, not that hard way. So he's wrestling with the concept of it, right? But then he says, but yet not as I will, but as you will. So he's got this resolve, even though he's empty, he's saying, okay, God, it's you. It's your plan, it's your way, it's your will. My life is in your hands. That, that's how we're supposed to live. That's, that's the beauty and the fullness of being a follower of Jesus Christ. It, it, it goes on in verse 40. It says, then he returned to his disciples and he found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for an hour, he asked Peter. And then in the middle of his of his agony in the middle of his trying to figure it out, he kind of finds enough oomph to try and teach them a little lesson real quick. Isn't that amazing that how even in his weakest moment, he's still thinking of others? He's still trying to help them, and he says, he says, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. You see, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Well, I think that sums up every single one of us as believers, doesn't it? I'm, I'm going to do it. God, I'm all in. I'm going to do it <laughs> tomorrow. Uh, the next day. <laughs> next week. I'm actually going to schedule that time with you. You know, <laughs> next summer when I go on that missions trip, bam, I'm your, like, you know what I mean? And, and, and we just, we say it, but the follow through is so hard for us. Verse 42, it says he went away a second time and he prayed. And he said, my father, if it's not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. So in his humanness, again, he's going, okay, I, I, this is so hard. But once again, God, your will be done in my life. Verse 43, it says when he came back, he again found them sleeping. Because their eyes were heavy. I'm just going to say this real quick. You, you stay awake for whatever you want. Isn't that true? You'll stay up to two in the morning watching a movie, playing a video game, doing whatever. You know, if, if you got to go skiing, you'll be up at five in the morning or golfing at four in the morning or whatever it is. And if you're going on a vacation, you'll catch a, you know, a plane any time of the day. You'll, you know, I'll do three connections and whatever just to get there. And you find the energy and the zeal and, and the awakeness that you need to do the things you really want to do. So when you find yourself not doing the things you say you want, then there's actually something deeper going on inside of you. Just throwing that out there. That's not my message. And he goes on. And he says this. In verse 44, he leaves them and he goes away for a third time. And he says the exact same thing. He shares his heart. He's real. And then he says, okay, God, not my will, but yours be done. So three times Jesus prayed to see if there was any other way. So I'm going to come up with three points, because I never have three points in my messages. <laughs> but really, the, the simplicity of the power of fullness is John 3.30, he must become greater, I must become less. More of God, more of his power, more of his strength, more of his anointing, more of his ways, more of his ideas, more of his love, more of him, less of us. That's what it's truly all about. So how do we get down this road if we keep falling asleep? If we keep ignoring what's going on around us and we're not willing to pray and to seek 
and to try and listen to what it is that God's calling us to do. How, how can we make something different and quit running on fumes and feeling empty? You see, em- emptiness is a good thing if you're a vessel just waiting in God's presence to be filled. Emptiness is a bad thing if you're not going to God's presence, asking him to fill you. If you walk around empty and you don't give God the opportunity, you're going to be cranky, you're going to be irritable, you're going to be angry, you're going to be lost, you're going to have no peace, you're going to be all over the board. But when you understand, okay, wait a minute. God, I need you. And you come into his presence and you allow him to fill you. That's where things began to change. So how can we begin to get this this mindset, the same mindset that Christ had? Here's the first thing that I see. You need to stop the useless pursuits. (laughs) Now, this is the one little lesson that he threw by the disciples there. You know, you're... You need to watch and pray because your spirit's willing, but your flesh is weak, right? Your spirit's willing, but your flesh is weak. So quit pursuing all the things that feed your flesh. Just because you're tired, don't go to sleep. Just because you're hungry, don't eat. Just because you don't want to, don't not do it. Just because you have a feeling doesn't mean It's the leading of the Spirit. You've got to tap into God. You've got to begin to distinguish, you know, what's God and what's you. And you've got to begin to put your flesh down on a regular basis. And the best way to put your flesh down is to stop the useless pursuits. Every single one of us has things that we pursue. And I'm not just talking sin. I'm just talking anything. It can be a hobby, it can be a career, it can be whatever it is. Things that we pursue that take everything we have. And we put it all in, and we dump it all in, and we wonder why we feel empty. Because we're using our finances, our resources, our energy, our heart. We're using it all on useless things. They're not things that are going to bear much fruit in our life. You know, one of the saddest things for me, and this is after being a youth pastor for 20 however many years, is the amount of pressure that American culture puts on kids, especially guys, to be athletes. And how we teach them to devote so much time, so much effort. Now, I love sports, and sports are, are good, and there's things you can learn from them. Taking care of your body is good. You know, team sports are great. There's dynamics you can lose, use. But let me tell you something. Every single one of those kids who was playing YSA soccer yesterday are not going to play in the World Cup. The odds of any of them getting there are pretty slim. The odds of their bodies being healthy enough <laughs> and not getting hurt to make it a lifelong career is even slimmer if they even did make it there. And so what we're doing is we're teaching the next generation, to pour everything in to something that's not potentially going to bear lasting fruit. You don't build your life on your athletic abilities. I found that out. That was the one thing that I loved. And at 21, actually at 18, when I first fell off a mountain, it was pretty much over. At 21, I had to get my first artificial hip. Yeah, it was done. You know? I literally had to wrestle with my identity because that, that's what I did. That was my, one of my pursuits. That's, that's how I identified myself. Rather than understanding that my identity is in Christ, and I'm not saying you can't play sports, and I'm not saying you can't be good at them. God uses athletes all over the place to bring him glory and honor. And if that's what you're called to do, then that's fine. But I tell you, I promise you, it's not the amount of kids that are in sports right now. So play sports, but don't make it a useless pursuit. Psalms chapter 10 verse 4 says this. It says, in his pride, the wicked man does not seek him. In all his thoughts, there's no room for God. So it's, it's the prideful, arrogant man or woman that goes into life, goes into their day, and tries to get their fill on the world. 
They're, they're, they're trying to get everything they can from what they do, from their careers, from relationships, from you know, their, their, their position in culture or whatever it is. They're trying to get everything they can. They're trying. And it's pride. And there's no room even in their thoughts for God. And that's what happens. Even to God-loving people. When we start pursuing things that aren't going to bear fruit. Again, I'm not talking about things that are, that are even sin. Where we're just investing so much in things that aren't going to help us become who we're called to be. So we've got to begin to set aside those vain pursuits. Because if we do, then we might actually have time and room in our life and in our day for God. For prayer. And if you're doing that, then you have to have room for others because you can't spend time in God's presence without getting a heart for people. So then now it's not just time for God. Now it's time to serve and to bless and to help. And it's a really cool thing how it all, how it all kind of rolls. Ephesians chapter 5, 18 through 20 says this. It says, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Don't try and get your fill the, the, the way the world does. Man, get full of the Spirit of God. And if you stop useless pursuits, I promise you, it'll stop your heart from being so divided when God speaks to you. Even going back to Jesus' example, he had his natural fleshly response or desire, and then he had God's. But there was no division. He had the thought, and he knew what the answer was going to be. I'm going to do it God's way. But for most of us, because we're not, you know, setting aside those vain pursuits and those things that are taking everything that we have, when it comes to those emotional decisions, we usually make the emotional one instead of the God-led one. And we're divided, we're torn. I mean, the Bible is pretty clear. You can't serve God and mammon or the world system or money. You can't do both. It's got to be one or the other. So the way that you stop your heart from being divided is you stop the useless pursuits. If you find yourself doing something that you just can't, can't live without, I promise you, you can live without it. Just take a moment. Take a break and refocus. Here's the second thing that we can do that, that will help us with our emptiness. We need to delete all wrong perspectives. Matthew chapter 26, verse 39. I already read this to you, but Jesus, going a little further, he fell down with his face to the ground, and he prayed. He said, My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And in every situation, in every circumstance, in every decision we have to make, there's always two perspectives. There's what we think and what we want and how we want to do it, and there's what God thinks and what God wants and the way that he wants to do it. And what we need to do is exactly what it says in 2 Corinthians 10.5. We've got to demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. God's asking you to do something. God's telling you to do something. Your flesh doesn't want to do it. But you say, not my will, but yours be done. It's too hard. No, I, I take that thought captive. God, I believe that I can do all things through you. If you're calling me to do it, I can do it. I don't think I could ever stop. Wait, no, I believe I can, God. If you're asking me to make a change, if you're asking me to make a shift, then I believe you're going to provide me the strength, you're going to provide me the finances. And we got to begin to take those thoughts captive. we got to get rid of all the wrong perspectives. The number one perspective that most of us have skewed is the perspective that God doesn't have our best interest in mind. That God is trying to withhold something from us when clearly he tells us in his word, no good thing do I withhold. He's not withholding anything. He's trying to guard us. He's trying to help us. And here's a really big one. And I I think this is paramount, especially after just doing a baby dedication. you got to think bigger than yourself. You've got to think of your family, and you've got to think of your godly legacy in those who are watching you make the decisions and the choices that you're making. It's huge. It's huge. You've got to get rid of every perspective that doesn't line up with the word of God. And if you began to delete all the wrong perspectives, it's actually going to make room 
and give you the opportunity to start trusting God more. And the more you do it, the more you'll trust him, the more you'll love being led by his spirit, the more you'll just find, like, you won't want to do anything else other than saying yes to God. Especially, now I'm not saying it's easy, but you'll love the fruit of it. <laughs> you'll love the fruit of doing the hard things. You absolutely will. So then here's the last one. And this is out of Matthew 26, 42. Jesus went away a second time when he prayed once again, my father, if it's not possible for this cup to be taken away, unless I drink it, may your will be done. And that's what I call surrendering control. And this is where so many of us, myself included at times, we struggle with just trying to control people, trying to control situations, trying to control our finances, trying to control how everything happens. Like, like we, we just want to grab a hold of things and make people and make circumstances line up the way that we want them to. And God's saying, man, you've got to just empty yourself. <laughs> you've got to just absolutely let it go. I want to read Matthew chapter 20. Verses 24 through 28, here's what it says. It says, uh, when, when the ten heard about this, well, I'm going to stop here for a second. So Jesus is, uh, some of his disciples kind of got wind uh, that those two sons of uh, Zebedee, James and John's mom, had a real hankering for her boys. And she wanted to make some things happen for her boys. She's like, okay, Jesus, here, here's, here's what I want to see happen. When you establish your kingdom, I want one of my boys on the right, and I want one of my boys on the left. That's what I want. That's, that's the way this is going to go down. That's what I see. I hope you see in my boys what I see, you know, and, and like, what do I have to do to make this happen? So then you go back here in, a, in verse 24. So when the 10, which is the other 10 disciples for you mathematicians, heard about this, it says they were indignant with the two brothers. So Jesus called them together and he said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded it over them and the high officials exercised authority over them, but not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. He goes, okay, wait a minute. Just quit thinking about who's in control, who, like, who's, who's, who's higher than who. Like, just forget about all of that and just serve Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So here's the deal. When it comes to control, <laughs> does it really matter? If you have say about everything. I'm talking to myself, too. Does it really matter? Or should I pri our priorities be just like Christ, where we just want to serve and be a blessing? Who cares if you get the credit? I just want to be obedient to God. And honestly, if we're going for natural, you know, trying, trying to get accolades and applause and thank yous on this earth, then that's what we get our fill of, and pretty, pretty soon you're empty again, and you need more. Come on, I need some more affirmation. I, I, I need some more, you know. And then you're empty again. Come on, I need some. But yet when you begin to find your affirmation and your fulfillment in simply walking in obedience to God, then you can be the greatest servant of all. And that puts you in first place in God's kingdom. But the only way that happens is if you yield control. Control of everything. That means, okay, God, I'm going to do it your way. I'm going to do relationships your way. I'm going to do work your way. I'm going to do finances your way. God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to believe you. I'm going to, if you say it, I'm going to do it. I, I'm, I'm not going to second guess. I mean, I can't imagine <laughs> how much grace God has to have to put up with what we throw at him. In accusations. Have you ever thought about that? How much we just rail on God for not doing what we want him to do? 
Do you realize how many people would just be off the face of the earth by lightning if we had control? Do you realize how many people wouldn't work at your place of employment if you controlled it? Can you imagine where all the finances would be if you had control? You know what I mean? It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. No. As believers, if we truly want to walk in the power of emptiness, we've got to yield control to God. What if he says, give it all away? Then give it all away. What if he says, go make it right when you weren't the one who, who did the wrong? Then go make it right. Humble yourself. What if he says, go fix that and don't tell anybody you did it? Then go fix it and don't tell anybody you did it. It's just whatever he says. It's about being a servant. That's the beauty of it. And when we begin to surrender control, the more control we surrender, the more we will take on his image and likeness of a servant. So if you struggle serving your spouse, if you struggle serving your kids, if you struggle serving your neighbors, if you struggle serving anybody, if you struggle letting somebody pull in in front of you when it's, you know, just to save them a few minutes, if you struggle with all of that, then guess what? There's some pride in control you're hanging on to. And it's time to just say, okay, God, I give you control. I just surrender it all. I give it all to you. And when you do, you have the ability now because you've emptied yourself of control, for God to say, okay, here's a servant. I can use him because I believe he set aside his own agenda, his own pride, or her own agenda, or her own pride. I don't want to just rail on guys, right? And he can trust us to walk out in obedience to the things that he's asking us to do. I want to close with this verse out of Colossians chapter 2. Here's what it says in 9 and 10. It says, for in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. Because he is the head over every power and authority. So what that means is, if we're willing to completely empty ourselves of everything, every, oh, there's more in there than I thought. That's the way it works. Like, God, I thought I got rid of it all. I thought, I, I thought I was giving you control. Well, no, not in that area. No, not in that area. God, I, I thought, it's like, man, what, like, where does this stuff keep coming from? Well, your flesh is going to be with you to the day you die, so this is going to be a constant emptying of yourself. But the beauty is, as you do it, you are making room for God to fill you to the fullness to the fullness. Everything you need is found in Him. It's not found in your strength. It's not found in your work ethic. It's not found in your perception or your natural wisdom. It's not found in your influence. It's not found in any of that. It's found in Christ. And when we humbly come before Him and say, okay, God, I feel empty right now. I feel empty a lot, actually. It's hard sometimes. But every time I feel empty and I get into God's presence, He fills me up. He fills me up with His love. You know, one of the biggest things that happens in His presence? My perspective changes because I stop thinking about me. I stop thinking about how empty I feel or how hard my life is. It's my life's not hard. Give me a break. You know what I mean? Imagine if you were a bunch of believers living in Ukraine right now. How would that feel? What would that be like? I was watching Pastor Maureen the other day. He FaceTimed me at like midnight, sending me a video. He's driving six hours one way and six hours back just to bring food and supplies. He's like, pray. I, want, I hope we get across the border in Ukraine so that we can bring all these food to the Christians and to the people there. That's not easy to do. But he's a servant. He, wa he wants to do God's will. He's laying down his own, his own desires, his own things. 
He actually sent a picture of himself eating with his family. He's like, this is the first time and I don't know how long since this whole thing happened that me and my family have got to sit down and enjoy dinner together. But yet here we are in America and we won't even make time when we have it to be with our family and sit down. I tell you, we have a lot of emptiness. And yet, there's a lot of things we still need to empty. Because God wants to fill us. Why don't you stand up in this place today? I don't know if you could do the song, It's Not Enough. That was like my message there. Because I feel like to fully walk this out, I feel like you've got to make a declaration. I'm not enough. I'm not. God, I need you. I need you more than charisma. I need you more than money. I need you more than strength. I need you more than anything. God, I need you. I cannot be who I'm called to be without you. And so I'm going to say a prayer, and then I just want you to take a moment as they sing. I just want you to make that declaration to God. If there's something in your life that's been a vain pursuit that you're wasting time, effort, and energy on, if there's control that you need to let go of, then just take, take this next couple minutes and just say, God, I give it to you. Lord, we're in this place today because we are a needy people in the natural. God, we need all that you have so God, we just purpose to empty ourselves of anything that would hinder your power, your presence, your anointing from coming and filling us, God, so that we can be the men, the women, and the church that you've called us to be. And God, as we take a few moments here, God, just speak to hearts. God, help us to just lay down anything and everything. God, that's holding us from walking in the fullness and the power that you want us to walk in. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Just, just take a couple minutes here. God is so good. My challenge and my encouragement to you. Don't put the lid back on. Keep the cap off. Keep emptying out anything and everything that would take the place of what God wants to do in and through your life. And if you're in this place and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, after we dismiss, come up and talk to one of us. We're going to be up here at the altar. We'd love to pray with you. We don't want you running around empty. We want you full of God's purpose and plan for your life, full of his love. Or if you need prayer for anything else, we'll be up here. But God, I just pray that as this congregation has opened up their hearts, as they've opened up their lives, God, that you would just continue to download your love, your power, your anointing, your purpose into them like never before. God, let them go into this day, into this week, into this Easter season so full that they've got something to offer to the world around them. God, use us to grow your kingdom for your glory. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. You guys have a blessed day.